Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff. Just want to extend my uh, gratitude and thanks for you guys being here. We really do appreciate it. It seems to be going well so far, and everyone's having a good time. So thank you again. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Austin Lefebvre. Can you guys hear me? Testing? Testing? All right. So much of the dismay of my friend Brett Harris, this is not about my previous relationships, de ditching the dump and hope approach. It is about fishes. Um, <clears throat> so the first time I heard the term ditching the dump and hope approach was actually coined by John Coppolino years ago. And if you think about it, it's really what most of us are doing. We're purchasing our fishes, we're acclimating our fishes, we're dumping them in our aquariums, and we're hoping for the best. When in reality, there's a lot more that we can do for our, these animals to ensure long, healthy lives. Um, and it all starts with sourcing the fish down through quarantine, conditioning, social acclimation. Um, you're going to hear me see, say some weird things uh, to some people. Fishes is the plural of multiple species. Fish is a plural of one species. So it took about four years after hearing the amazing Dr. Pyle talk about fishes um, for me to beat that into my head uh, and, and use it uh, as properly, which, which I like to think that I do now. Um, but first of all, if you don't know me, who, who am I? Um, I was the weird kid on the team who wore the wrong colored jersey and couldn't put his helmet on picking dandelions in the field. Um, I always tried to keep up with sports with my friends, but in reality, animals kept my attention a lot better. Um, my parents recognized this and supported me throughout my entire life. Um, frequented SeaWorld, I had every Jacku Stow book you could imagine, um, and they instilled just a terrible sense of fashion, too, uh, that I try to, to shake the older that I get. <clears throat> uh, I've been in the industry professionally since 2002, pretty much have done everything besides commercial collection. Um, started diving when I was 12, done some nitrox dives, no rebreathers yet, but uh, hopefully someday and I consistently seek uh, new fashion trends from the ocean. Um, so far, nothing is stuck, but being in San Diego, I highly encourage you guys to try something because I, I think we can really get something going. Um, I fail miserably at that. Uh, these are my neighbors and best friends, Todd and Brett of Cherry Corals. Some of you guys might recognize me. They've contracted uh, my old business and my current business to work with them at the bigger shows. Um, since we became neighbors with them, we uh, take care of their raceways when they travel to smaller shows that we don't do with them. Uh, my business partner and I do. Uh, here he is. Um, he instigates, instigates all kinds of mischief around both of our offices, like uh, getting into the shipping containers and uh, doing the cherry ducks and so forth. Um, and this is my business, Aquabox. Um, we install reef aquariums worldwide, and we still have a love for unique freshwater aqu aquarium installations. But most importantly, our systems are safe, uh, reliable, with an overall focus of ease of maintenance. No one wants to tinker with their equipment all the time. I don't. So that's what we do uh, for our clients. The easier a system is to maintain, uh, the better success you're going to have in general. Of course, that includes uh, custom water mixing stations making that shore a breeze. <clears throat> and then what you guys are here to, to see today is uh, we fully quarantine and condition fishes. Um, I've been doing this on a small scale professionally for about four years for local clients and some clients for Cherry. After we moved there in early 2015, we intended to start selling fishes immediately. Um, it's undescribed to science still. Luis talked about that the other day. Uh, but quickly found out to do fishes the way that I wanted to. I had to scale it up in a, in a, in a reasonable manner. We had no interest in fighting for the bottom price of, of these animals. Uh, it devalues animal lives and, and increases the cut flower mentality. So we spent the next year and a half uh, scaling up our intense quarantine protocols with the help of uh, public aquarists, tenured industry pros, and, and expert hobbyists. So the dump and hope in general uh, involves two standard acclimation processes. We, we talk here about a lot, the float bag and the drip method. Uh, we'll look at both of those later. After acclimation, we dump the fish into the aquarium, hope for the best. Um, and generally speaking, this is incredibly stressful on new additions that have just gone through the supply chain and ended up in our hands. Our goal should be to get all animals thriving, whether you're a hobbyist, whether you're in the industry. Um, if not, I'm pretty blunt, and I'll tell you, you're in the wrong hobby, you're in the wrong industry. We want these animals thriving. They sh we should ensure they live long, healthy lives. They're not cut flowers. Uh, reef fishes, can, we've consistently seen they can live longer in captivity than they can in the wild. In the wild, generally reef fishes aren't dying of old age. Uh, as soon as they get older and they slow down, they're taken out by a predator, they're eaten. Um, in captivity, we see them get old and die of old age, which is pretty awesome. But uh, what, what, we, what I see a lot is uh, you don't hear people saying, babe, the dog died, let's go to the store and get another one tomorrow. Um, you know, like disposable dogs, right? Now, I understand that fishes aren't going to be looked at by me and some of the other people you've heard talk of uh, this weekend. Um, I'm a freak, I'll tell you that straight up. Um, but they have the potential to live really long lives if we have the foresight uh, to do that and make the right choices. Um, so a couple long-lived fish. This is uh, the Kitadon Smith Eye, kind of the, the holy grail down in Hawaii now. This was collected by Brian Green um, in 2001. Those of you that know Brian Green, look at his luscious blonde hair, long hair he used to have. Um, he's pretty gray and balding now. 
Um, you know, and so we've seen brine change since this fish was collected, and this fish is still alive in an aquarium. Um, here we have the, the almighty Paracentra pygiboilei that Dr. Rich Pyle talked about yesterday. Um, roughly 15 years old, because we don't know how old these animals were, were when they were collected. Um, Chip Boyle collected this in 2001. These are both photos from my, my good buddy Lemon, and he's like, Austin, use whatever you want. Um, but this is an iconic fish, still alive, thriving in captivity, 15 years. Um, and finally, this, <laughs> this butterfly fish to me looks like it needs a walker to get around the aquarium. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just so old and aging. And, uh, you know, this fish would be taken out probably pretty quick in the wild because it does, probably doesn't, you know, has issues swimming and so forth. Roughly 22 years old, this fish is. Okay. Um, so overall, uh, through the entire journey and, and our process of getting these animals to our aquariums, our goal should be to keep stress to a minimum. Um, this poor guy is, you know, going to turn into a smoothie. Um, stress affects fish in two ways. It produces effects that disrupt or threaten homeostatic equilibrium, and it induces adaptive behavioral and physiological responses. Uh, it's a great quote from, that I read years ago. It's the number one killer of fish, stress is. And stress is, stress is a series of hormones, right? It's not actually just like a thought process. It's actually hormones. Stress can outright kill a fish if it gets high enough, but what we commonly see is, is as stress increases, immunity decreases. Okay, so in nature, we see fishes commonly with diseases relatively unscathed. I've seen it more times than I can count while diving. Um, but in the ocean, we have these huge uh, bodies of water, obviously, where the parasites start to breed and they get dispersed um, compared to our little tanks. And then, of course, in, in nature, fish's main uh, stressors are um, avoiding predation, finding food, and finding a mate. As soon as we collect them and put them through this journey, um, we're putting them on, under all kinds of stresses that they're normally not used to. So again, uh, stress hormones go up, immunity de decreases, and they be can become overrun. So main goal is to reduce new stress, uh, I'm sorry, reduce stress on these new fishes. And, and that can be done in a few ways. So the common issues I've seen over the past 13 years is uh, people sourcing the cheapest fish. Cheap does not equal affordable. Impulse purchases, skipping quarantine and conditioning, lack of feeding in the quarantine and display aquarium, this feeding every three day things to ensure they're working uh, is, should be by the wayside like pounds per gallon of live rock and watts per gallon for lighting. Um, we have the incredible equipment these days, the ability to do big water changes and remove these nutrients. So we, we need to be hammering these fishes with food as they would eat in nature um, and no social acclimation period. And, and this is a, a big thing we'll touch on later. Um, this is what I see a lot, it's particularly working with the cherry corals guys. Uh, this is a beautiful encrusted frag that they had. And we see these uh, hobbyists screaming for, you know, encrusted frags, healed frags, no fresh cuts, no fresh cuts. But when we see fish, it's give me the cheapest fish. Give me the best warranty. Give me the cheapest fish. Um, some people will start, let me see the fish eat. And that's kind of the first stage. But it, there's a huge disconnect. Um, and it's kind of interesting that, that I see this. Oh, this is a great quote. Internal worm infections are found in approximately 70 to 85 percent of tropical marine fish imported from the Philippines, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Hawaii, the Caribbean, Australia, and the Red Sea. Like everywhere, right? Everywhere our fishes are coming from, um, internal worm infections are found like this. Uh, this book was recommended to me a few years ago by uh, Kevin Cohen, who I think is in here, and it's a great beginner book to kind of get your you know, ducks in a row, shall we say, regarding this stuff. And uh, Bassler was um, uh, oversaw a wholesaler in Europe. He was a fist fish pathobiologist, and he was seeing roughly one million fish per year. So this isn't some small sample size. This isn't a hobbyist doing this with three or four fish. A million fish per year, he's seen 70 85% come with internal worm infections. And of course, that stat isn't touching these other things we see in the, in the, in the industry, uh, virus like lymphocystis, uh, bacterial infections, and, and potential external parasites. Um, so are you ready? If you're sourcing simply based on cheap fishes and nothing else, are you ready for this stuff? Um, to really understand how these fishes become stressed, we have to break down the journey. Uh, the journey is pretty straightforward. Um, you guys know it. It's, it's collected, goes to an exporter. The industry standard for a lot of exporters is to move it out as soon as possible, but that can vary greatly. This is sent to me by my friend Julian Baggio after I said, send me some great pictures um, of Cairns Marine. Um, and this is just a fantastic, beautiful facility. Um, they kind of set the standard of best practice for a lot of collectors and exporters, in my opinion. Um, and then, of course, from there, they're sent to an uh, importer and wholesaler. The industry standard for most wholesalers is to ship out within uh, 48 to 72 hours. Um, I've been in a wholesalers on a Monday, and they're just chock full of fishes, and I go in on a Wednesday, and they're empty. Um, it's just constantly churning fishes in and out, churning out. But not all wholesalers do this, okay? But that is kind of the industry standard. Um, this is Quality Marine in LA. A lot of you guys have heard of them. This, this is not their, their standard practice. So there are good and bad ways of doing this, but hobbyists don't see it a lot. Um, and then, of course, from there, uh, it's sent to the retailers. 
This is um, actually Proust Pretz in, in Lansing, and, and the owner is over here. He's set uh, a lot of really great things uh, for, for me to see. They're semi-local to me as a local fish store. These guys were holding fishes behind the scenes for, for quite a while and letting some of these issues arise so they could treat them before they're offering them to them or their clients. It's really a great practice. But the industry standard is still seven to 10 days. The, a lot of times at 14 days, retailers are losing money. Um, they do this because they're focused on cheap fishes. They wanna compete with Bob's fish over here and John's fish over here and maybe make some money on salt or something. So they're trying to pump out these cheap fishes. It devalues animal lives and only increases the cut flower mentality when we're pumping out fishes without any forethought as the future. Um, and I already mentioned this gentleman is here with us today. Um, so the thing as I, continue to delve into this, uh, the, the journey itself that I notice is, is it goes two ways pretty quick, starting with collection. We have affordable and we have cheap. Um, and, and directly correlated with that is sustainable choices for affordable fishes and devaluing animals for cheap fishes. Um, inter interestingly enough, once we look at it, you'll see, this is affordable for nature. This is not affordable for nature. A lot of this is actually destroying habitat, destroying the reef. Um, this stuff doesn't, doesn't do that. So <clears throat> looking at the devaluing animal side, the cheap fishes, unfortunately, cyanide fishing still exists. Um, I've had people call me out online and you literally tell me they hope that I never have kids because if I believe this on the internet, um, then I'll believe anything. It couldn't be further from the truth. We've seen it, we know it exists. Um, some collectors actually destroy coral to catch fishes hiding within it, rip over a coral head and try and pull some fishes out of there um, with you know, no, no foresight as to what that's gonna do to the habitat. Um, and this is the beginning of what I call the hot potato, which is getting the fish from A to B to C to D to U as fast as possible, not worrying about any ailments, um, and, and hopefully they're moving fishes before they're, they're dying. Um, and it's really just a, a nasty practice. Um, some exporters, wholesalers, and retailers are holding fishes in less than desirable conditions. Uh, here we can see this exporter has really, really cramped fishes in here, no hiding places. We're seeing species like uh, sailfin and tang being mixed together that we all know, and even giant aquariums can be kind of difficult to mix. Um, these fishes are probably so stressed they might not even fight yet, but I don't want anything that's gone through a, a system like this, and, and frankly, neither should you. Um, so we still see this hot potato going. And then unfortunately, we see it on the retailer side too. This was at a show, I took this picture, I cropped it to avoid any, I'm not calling anybody out, but uh, be really careful at smaller reef shows when you see stuff and you see really cheap fish for sale like this because uh, it's not best practice for the industry, it devalues animal lives and it's gonna put a lot of extra stress on you and the animals. Um, Macna would never allow this, we would never see this here. Racing to the price bottom ensures destructive collection methods and undesirable holding conditions continue. That's the bottom line. I've never seen anybody try to race to the bottom and actually do it successfully without doing one of these two things. Um, it just doesn't happen. Uh, to quote my friend Jim Walters from his Magna Talk 2014, value is service, time, and information. <coughs> Cheap does not equal affordable for you, for the animals, or for the environment. So let's look at the good side, uh, the bright side, over the rainbow and so forth. Sustainably minded choices, it really all starts with hand net collection um, and, and people that know what they're, what they're doing. So it can be really low tech, homemade fins and a mask. Um, and it can be really high tech. This is uh, Bart Shepard of California Academy of Science. These are scientific divers, um, but they do, there are people doing these really great methods uh, for our industry too. This is just a fantastic picture. Look at those fishes, it's amazing. So utilizing properly trained collectors who avoid damaging coral, target proper sex and age, and use ideal decompression methods is a sustainably minded choice. And of course, we wanna support supply chains that are utilizing proper life support, acclimation and treatment methods. Cairns Marine, again, they're, they're just fantastic people. They, they're really proud of the animals that come out of their facility, as they should be. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, there's other ones that do great work too, um, but these guys are just so transparent and, and they do a good job. Uh, I, I don't know if Julian's in here right now. I didn't tell him I was gonna quote him from his talk, but I'm gonna. Sustainable wild collection for aquarium supply is the ultimate environmental choice because it has a smaller carbon footprint than culturing corals and fishes intensively by man-made facilities. Uh, we're gonna look at aquaculture here briefly in a minute, but uh, this is, uh, if you really think about it compared to some of the things that are being done for, for all fishes across the board, um, he's right. Um, Australian collectors have developed provision reef to be proactive in regulation rather than waiting for laws to force regulation. Uh, Cairns Marine actually alerts Port Authority as they're coming in from their boat uh, to ensure full transparency. They're unloading it so Port Authority can see it and they're getting a quick transfer from their vessel to their facility so the animals are boom, boom in the facility, don't have to sit in bags or anything and they're in filtered running water. So we wanna support proactive supply chains that are doing this kind of thing right and I would love to see more proactive supply chains uh, come about and I know that there's been some talk of it recently and uh, I personally hope to learn more about it here soon, what's, what's going on in, in the American side of things, because we have a lot of people, great people working on this right now. Um, Ornamental Aquatic Trade Association released a phenomenal report earlier this year 
um, and a couple things really stuck out to me. So th this is a couple of them. In 2007, the Maldives tuna exports, food fishes, averaged $1,600 per ton, while the exported ornamental were estimated at $590,000 per ton, 372 times the value of weight in fish. So I started thinking, what does this look like as, as, a, as a global scale? They had that stat further down in the report, too. 0.0001% of fish caught from the sea globally are intended for the aquarium trade. The rest is food fishes. Okay? So it's, it's a small percentage of overall uh, fishes caught from nature is, is destined for us. And unfortunately, what we've seen is when some areas are turned away from, um, these collectors are driven into other industries. They have to make money. There's no public schools. These people are using the, the money to uh, put their children in school, keep a roof over their head, and keep food on their table. Um, so what they end up going to do is fishing for food. Well, we just saw how much more money they get for an ornamental fish compared to an aquaculture, or I'm sorry, compared to a, a food fish. So now we're uh, pulling a lot more fishes off the reef uh, compared to maybe one or two fish for the same amount of money. Um, to, to feed these people. And then logging, so now let's go inland and destroy terrestrial habitat. Coral mining, while illegal most places, it still happens, they'll actually take a live coral, utilize their calcium carbonate skeleton for limestone. Ranching and agriculture are, you know, we see it everywhere, but when you're really close to, uh, to, to natural reefs here, we see some really devastating effects. Uh, Dr. Rocha uh, touched on this briefly, but sedimentation pouring over the reefs, um, choking out corals, killing the corals or uh, causing algae blooms, killing corals, and fishes leave or they just die. They, they have no habitat. Um, so, in my opinion, purchasing sustainably collected wild caught animals is likely the best way that hobbyists can directly influence conservation apart from donating to reef conservation organizations. However, I am not discrediting the amazing accomplishments of aquaculturists, but what we see is this tribalism. I only want aquacultured fish. I only want aquacultured fish. I don't care about wild caught. Never, 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 never wild caught. Well, if, you know, if we're never doing any wild caught, this is what we're going to see happen to a lot of the natural reefs, unless we have some other form of perhaps getting them to aquaculture on these, on, in these regions, which could be really cool, something to look at. <clears throat> but we can't just write them off. And, and uh, the wild collection. But these guys have done so many amazing things. I mean, in the past 11 months, so last MACNA, uh, I, I remember talking to several people that said, you know, a lot of these fishes would never be bred. So in the last 11 months, we've seen yellow tang, yashagobi, blue tang, potter's angels, millet butterfly, and cleaner ass. What? Like amazing fish, aquaculture and captivity. Um, much of it is thanks to our friend over here, Javier Montalvo, who's done all of these things, potter's angel, millet butterfly, cleaner ass, um, you know, in the past several weeks, right? And uh, we hear about, like, these bigger organizations doing it when this gentleman right here had so much to do with it. Thank you, Javier. You're amazing. Um, thank you. But unfortunately, what I see as a retailer is people talking about it, the big talk, you know, what is it? Talk the talk, not walk the walk. Um, Austin, these are great. I want that. Yeah, yeah. So we'll take the yellow tang. Okay, Joe, it's $100. Um, what? I can get a wild caught one for $40 to $60. Why would I ever buy that fish? I'm not going to buy it until it's cheaper than the wild caught counterpart. Well, it's never going to get cheaper than the wild caught counterpart unless we're supporting them. Right? We need to support them right off the bat. This is incredibly expensive. These fish should probably be four or $500 coming out after all the work these guys have put into them. And we're talking about a $40 to $60 gap now between the wild caught uh, properly conditioned specimen compared to uh, an aquaculture specimen. Well, yellow tangs is a tenured animal when cared for properly. They can easily live for over a decade. So we just looked at the fishes in the beginning that were really long lived. So we're talking about four to six dollars per year to support these amazing efforts than going out and just saying, let's bring in more fish, let's bring in more fish for cheaper. It's really not asking much, I don't think, anyways. Um, we also need to realize that most funding for aquaculture labs uh, that are initially doing this stuff is focused on food fishes. There's too many humans reproducing on the planet, not enough food. So there's all the money going into how do we keep humans surviving, not how do we put fish in aquariums. Um, so when people do get involved from these amazing labs, and there are labs solely focused on this stuff, we really need to support them and say, you guys are awesome, thank you so much. And then the labs that will go back to focusing on uh, food fishes inevitably as their funding comes through um, can pass this information on to our industry people that uh, want to continue breeding things and, and really get them going. But our industry people, let's just say ORA for example, will have no interest in setting up these giant tanks and so forth that's necessary to breed these other fishes that they haven't been working with unless we tell them we want them. And how do we tell them we want them? We purchase the animals. You know, we can't just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and then let them all go by the wayside. Unfortunately, like we saw ORA had to do with their mandarin gobies. Um, so we must show support from all levels. You know, wholesalers need to be buying these fishes from the aquaculturists, retailers need to be buying it, and we need a hobbyist supporting it too. Um, there was a lot of talk initially about, oh, look at that ugly yellow tang, you know, and HLE and so forth, um, when really one of my good friends, Jay Hemdall, kind of quickly defunct that it wasn't HLLE. 
Um, it was something else, perhaps a nutritional deficiency. So I reached out to um, my sales rep, uh, Bobby from Quality Marine, and, and he said, Austin, you can use a couple of these pitchers. So this was actually the first batch some of those fishes we were seeing issues with. Um, and given good time, proper nutrition, and, and good water, it all faded away. The second batch came in even better. Um, and I stood there for about an hour and a half the other day and watched these fishes swim around. We still see a couple issues, but given time, good nutrition, and clean water, uh, these animals turn the corner really quick. And, Man, they're just banging beautiful little animals, you know, that we're going to keep for, for a decade or, or more easily. And then we need to realize there's fantastic information available for home breeders as well. Um, I'm really lucky to have this actually about 20 minutes from my office. Um, this is the MBI workshop. It happens every year. It's a tight-knit com tight -knit community that works tirelessly to show that marine fishes can be bred. Um, even the impossible ones, right? Um, there's incredible efforts being put forth into cultured foods as well. Chad Clayton of uh, Reed Mariculture Reef Nutrition was here to teach these guys how to do this stuff in their basements and in their garage, what they do at, uh, out in California, we're in California, uh, at Reed Mariculture. Um, and Kathy Leahy has a full-time job. She spoke this year. She does this stuff as a hobbyist. Um, and she uh, bred coral beauty angelfishes in her basement. Oh, she's right there. Hi, Kathy. She bred them in her basement after her full-time job. Right? So it, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, these giant places doing this all the time. Uh, Kathy's shown us that, and many other amazing, amazing breeders have as well. But we must show them support. We must show them we care. And we can't say, I'm not going to support this until it's cheaper than the wild caught counterpart, because that's crazy. Crazy talk. <clears throat> rare fishes. I love rare fishes. This is my thing. This guy is my, my amazing god over here, Dr. Rich Pyle. He does a lot of this stuff. Um, they don't poop gold or diamonds, unfortunately. If, if they did, um, Lindsay and I might be doing this from afar, Skype sitting on a, on a remote island somewhere, but they don't. Um, they're from remote locations. So a lot of these locations are two, three, and more day boat ride away from the nearest airport. Well, we have to get these fishes back to the airport to ship them out to get them to us. So these remote locations put a lot of stress on these things. And, and they have to find boats that work in these remote locations. And then, of course, if we're catching fishes, most of the time they're not going to do too well being held in bags in the bright sun on the, the bow of a boat. So they're using live wells outfitted with pumps, or uh, I mean, even some people put great filtration systems on there. So they're from remote locations. And then, of course, um, this was mesophotic reef fish until yesterday. It's now twilight zone reef fish. Same thing, deep water animals. Um, it requires a lot of time and effort to get trained on these things. This is my buddy Rufus Chimera, one of my favorite pitchers ever, with his uh, Paracentripagibolii and Centripagi narcosis, um, peppermint and narcosis angelfishes, and here he is on a rebreather. So they have to uh, incur this incredible upfront cost to get the rebreather, to get the rebreather there, and then these require different gases. And guess what? These gases don't exist in these remote locations, so they have to ship these things there. So we're talking about, last time I talked to Rufus about an um, expedition he was doing, I believe he said it was thirty dollars to $40,000 of upfront cost just to get it going, just to ship this stuff there. So that's why these fishes are costing so much. And of course, unfortunately, there, there is an incredible risk of human loss. These, these guys are very well trained, but it is very, very dangerous what they're doing. I have lost two friends personally from collecting fishes, and I know of many others. But they're not rare in nature. If you talk to any deep water diver, um, they're like, yeah, we see them here and there, you know, but, but overall, um, they're, they're kind of all over the place. They're just at deep depth, so it's expensive to get them here, um, and that's why they're rare in the industry. They're not rare in nature. Um, rare fishes in nature are like brown, and nobody wants them in their aquarium, right? <clears throat> so, know your retailer. This is really important. I know how fun it can be to bounce around on Sundays at various fish stores and pick up a thing here, pick up a thing here, uh, but in reality, we really need to know our retailers and, and question them a little bit more and trust them. Um, we're, buying, we're buying puppies to live long lives and die of old age in our aquariums. We're not buying uh, little fish that, oh, whatever, babe, we'll go get another one, you know? Um, so retailers should also know and trust your wholesalers. Wholesalers know and trust your importers, collectors. Transparency is a huge issue from certain regions. Um, uh, great people in the industry have done a, a significant job of, of getting more areas to be transparent, but there's still a lot of issues with it. Um, there are collection areas that we don't have any issues with it. We know exactly where these fish is from. I know exactly where, where my bandits came from, at what depth they were collected and everything. So it can be done. Uh, there's a lot of improvement we can do there. Um, and then ask your retailer, how long has the fish been there? What region is the fish from? What treatments has it undergone? What is it eating? And if possible, ask to see the fish eat. If your retailer can't answer these questions, you might decide to move on. Choosing your fish. Look for clear fins and eyes. This is, this is pretty common knowledge. You guys know a lot of this stuff. 
Um, look for clear fins and eyes, normal swimming patterns and positions, acceptable respiration rates. Um, spring and fall are the best times to ship fishes. Uh, I'm in Michigan, and it's obviously, we have really cold winters, brutal, it's terrible, don't want to be in Michigan anymore. Um, and then the summers get really hot as well. Um, so if clients are asking me to ship a four-figure fish, you're pretty hard-pressed to get me to do it unless it's spring or fall, hold it till then, no big deal, the fish is going to do great, they live for a long time. Um, otherwise, we have risk of FedEx or UPS or whatever cooking my fish or freezing my fish before it even gets to you, and then you know I'm going to take care of my clients. But uh, if you're really getting into the, the, the harder fish, just plan on spring and fall. You're going to have better success with that. And I see this a lot. Um, we see some really great warranties. Um, one of my biggest mentors, uh, Kevin Cohen, and I believe he's sitting here today, he's done a fantastic job and, uh, with these animals and, and put a warranty on them that is just unbelievable. But what we see from other uh, retailers, or no names need to be mentioned, but they're using it as a buzzword to make you guys feel warm and fuzzy inside, right? And uh, oh, I, probably the most common question I'm asked is how cheap is your fish and what's your warranty? Well, I won't even answer the warranty until we talk a little bit more. Um, because what we see is uh, retailers are shipping out X amount of fish, and ho you know, Y amount of fish will die, and, I'm sorry, Y amount of fish will survive, and they have to replace the difference here. Um, and hopefully, in their mind, it continues to go like this, so they can make enough profit to, to, to do this warranty. And unfortunately, the smaller retailers that don't really know what they're doing, we see them kind of dwindle and eventually fade away, and uh, they're defunct in a couple years. It's really a terrible practice to just strap a random warranty on your fish to make clients feel better about it and not do anything else for these animals. I don't like it, it devalues animal lives. Oh, these fish, <laughs> okay, um, I am not here to bash vendors, I am here to educate you guys. These next few pictures have been cropped heavily, there's no credit provided to them, um, don't sell slick fishes, you won't be on my slides. Um, but, you know, these were all for sale on a major reef forum, okay, and even, I think you can see them pretty easily, but even on my monitor, you know, these were all bare bottom tanks, these aren't pieces of sand. You can quickly pick out a few things that are wrong with this wrasse. Um, Here's something wrong with this tang, a couple parasites going on. Uh, these are all places that say they quarantine their fishes as well. My babies, the banded angels, Apollo Mitchell Sarcuatus. Um, something to note here about damaged soft fin rays is under good conditions, high quality water, high quality food, these are gonna heal within a week, 90% of the time I would say. And we see a lot of this. This means that the fish was photographed to sell the first day or a couple days after they received them. No time to settle on. We got parasite, parasite, parasite. Cheat up fin, begging for a bacterial infection if it doesn't already have one. Same thing here, beat up fins. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on this multi bar, but parasite, parasite, parasite. <clears throat> and this poor little Africanus angel, look at that tail just shredded. I mean, that, you know, probably already has bacterial infection. I'm seeing frayed fins here, frayed fins here. And, and some spots elsewhere. Um, but the thing that really gets me, and my girlfriend and my neighbors, Cherry Quarles, can hear me yelling, is all these fish is sold. All of these fish is sold. And w really having these fishes sell is comparable to like an Acropora head uh, being half dead and, and, and having that sold. If these were ending up on hobbyist forums, you know people would be screaming about, oh, that's a half dead Acro, can't believe you're selling it. Um, but these fishes are selling. On to the next thing, quarantine, the scary word. Uh, but don't be scared, be prepared. Um, what I recommend to my clients and what I did as a hobbyist for a long time is 15 to 20 gallon tanks generally adequate unless you're buying huge fishes. You want an oversized power filter on there. This is an AquaClear 70 on a 15 gallon tank. Um, and what it does is it ensures a lot of flows going through there. That number is arbitrary. It's just uh, there are formulas they use, but don't worry about it too much. We want pretty much as much flow as we can get in there. Keeps detritus and excess food in suspension. Keeps our fishes healthy. Keeps our fishes moving. And when they're swimming, they're exercising in it helps their metabolism keep going, they're gonna to wanna to eat when they're moving. Um, you know, a fish sitting in a little bubbled tank or whatever, they're from the ocean, there's a lot of current, let's replicate that, keep them happy. Um, this is touchy for me, but I do not recommend seeding your quarantine filter media in your display aquarium. Um, as soon as you move your quarantine media from your display into your quarantine system, you've now cross-contaminated that system. What most people don't realize is there's probably dormant disease or ailments existing in your uh, display aquarium. It's coming in on snails, it's coming in on corals, maybe you let a fish sneak, sneak through too fast. Now we have cross-contaminated it and potentially infected these really stressed out fish which has just been moved into our quarantine systems with whatever the heck our uh, display aquariums have. So I highly recommend just set it up, new salt water, uh, beneficial bacteria is great, but it is, most of these tanks are still touchy until about three week point, FYI. You know, the marketing is great, four or five days. They're still touchy until about three weeks, no matter what, um, in my opinion. Uh, we use a heater because uh, it's cold and it sucks in Michigan. Um, you, redundant heaters are evil. You guys are really, really evil. There's only a couple good brands out there, and even for smaller tanks, these, these, those heaters start at about 
$500 or more. Um, so our average hobbyist heaters, um, you know, they work, but they're evil. They, they, they do fail, so use something redundant. An external controller with a separate temperature probe, that's just gonna jump up and, and back this up in case the heater fails, and we're gonna, we're gonna cover all our bases there. We use these a lot. Um, Seacom Money Alerts are great for uh, various systems. Some people complain about difficult to read. Use a flashlight and shine right over it and you're gonna see these colors a lot better. Um, if you're keeping multiple fishes in there, you're probably always gonna see a little bit of green. Not a huge concern, this is where we really need to get worried. Um, hiding places are absolutely necessary. We want these fishes to relax and settle down. Uh, PVC is great, couple elbows in the bottom, but don't use a giant piece of PVC for a tiny fish or a tiny piece of PVC for a giant fish. We need them to feel comfortable. And generally, these fishes are gonna feel most comfortable something they can kind of scoot in like it's a little crevice in a rock like they do in nature. That's the best way to do it. Definitely put a top on your tank. Please put tops on all your tanks. I have six or seven rimless aquariums around the office. They all have tops on them. They're beautiful systems. Um, and I really ticked off a client one time by kind of saying, I'm not doing anything else for you until we put a top on the tank. Um, they're going through all of this stuff to get to us and then we're gonna sit here at the end and say, ah, I'm not gonna put a top on it because it looks cooler. Well, all fish can potentially jump. In fact, my first ten, uh, job at a local fish store, I was about 17, and I had a, like a 13-inch lionfish jump out of a tank at me. Um, you know, and as a 17-year-old, I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? Well, I didn't do anything. The owner didn't have a top on the tank. The fish got a little bit spooked. Um, and you know, that's a meaty fish actually able to launch itself out of the aquarium. So wrasses, yeah, they're gonna jump, but so is everything else, pretty much besides a seahorse. Um, if, you know, something clicks. I've been told frogfish don't jump either, but I actually know of one, one person who lost a frogfish, you know, like they're, they're like a gumpy gumdrop, and he, he jumped out of the tank. Um, so put a top on it. Glass and acrylic, uh, I don't like it on systems like this because we wanna ensure there's a lot of oxygenation still able to occur. So egg crater screen if you're using tiny fishes, I'm sorry, housing tiny fishes is, is really a great way to go. Um, ambient lighting is perfectly fine, but they do need a photo period. So eight hours, 12 hours of light, it doesn't really matter as long as it's a consistent photo period. Um, I had someone, names will not be mentioned, watch my uh, warehouse when we went to, uh, when we were traveling, they left the light on all the time when I came back and a couple of the fishes were pretty sick because it was just like constant day. So make sure you have a photo period. Bright lighting on these things is not ideal if you plan to medicate. Um, there are certain medications that will actually be broken down by pretty common reef lighting. Um, so ambient lighting is perfectly fine. Um, and as I touched before, established one month prior to purchasing the fish, be ready for these fishes. Have 100% water change ready at all times. You don't wanna be sitting there when your fish is huffing on the side with five gallon buckets, your stress is going up, fish's stress is going up, everybody's all stressed out, so terrible. Have 100% water change ready. 600 gallons is a little aggressive. Um, I'd like to see you all do it, but you might not need that. Mix it for at least 24 hours, just like we would for our reef aquarium. There's really no concern with uh, dissolution of, of anything from, from the water for fishes like we see with some salts doing with reefs. Um, we use a high quality salt and I'll mix all salts for a long time, Doesn't not, not a big deal, but some will uh, have issues over time. Doesn't matter for fishes. Use fresh salt water, not display tank water. Same thing we just looked at, cross-contaminating from your display to your quarantine tank. I learned this from Mr. Koji years ago and it's one of the best pieces of advice I had because I was actually infecting fish with uh, what I thought was a pretty great display tank. Well, there was ick in it and I didn't realize it. And I'm uh, treating these fish, treating these fish. Use fresh salt water. Um, mix it, but, but, but have it mixed. And don't get lazy. Um, really on these smaller uh, uh, quarantine systems, you should be prepared or just do 50% uh, water change every 48 to 72 hours. Um, this is gonna ensure that your water uh, parameters remain stable. We're not letting the nutrients build up. We're not even getting to the point where these animals are stressing out due to poor water quality. Um, and in the industry, we use a term called heavy water, and this really prevents heavy water. The only way I can display it is, uh, explain it is kind of based on looks. But with little amounts of filtration, the water can actually do weird things. So just be prepared and, and do big water changes, and you're gonna save yourself a lot of headache. It doesn't take uh, much effort to do a water change on those tiny tanks. Um, separate territory disputes as soon as possible. I see a lot of retailers, or I have retailers locally calling me up and saying, awesome, I'm losing a lot of chromos, I'm losing a lot of antheas, what the hell's going on? And I get there and it's just beat up fins. All these fishes are beat up. Um, days two and three, you know, fishes are settling in. They're gonna start establishing hierarchies and uh, we need to allow them to do that, but be aware of what's doing it. So we use a lot of egg crate and various mesh around the office. Um, this egg crate was chosen on purpose based on the size of fishes. These are Pseudanthias bimaculatus from my friends who are sitting back there. Um, and this is the, the male here. And we allow them to go back and forth. Um, and for whatever reason, this fish decided to be a jerk. And he chased all, the, all these females were here. I placed them here. And they squeezed through here. This is a deep water Pseudanthia charlene we'll look at later. Um, but he's fine with them. And even the little sunburst got in on the party and they're having a party over here and this guy's left alone. 
I took this picture specifically for this slide and loaded it. Do you see that? I didn't see it until I blew it up on my computer. So I went back there and I'm like, what the heck is that? That was another female Bomaculatus anthias that uh, was too fat to go between the egg crate. Um, she had been eating so well that she couldn't get back and forth. So I just bloop, put her over here, perfectly fine. Uh, within about two weeks, for whatever reason, this fish settled down, and now everybody's sharing the party. There's an aggressive angelfish over here, so nobody goes over there. Um, but, you know, we just want to separate them and give them these hiding places and be aware. Um, with chromie, they're really difficult to prevent from picking on one another once they start to settle in. So what we actually do is we'll take, like, three from one chamber and throw them over here, three from here, and we just confuse them. And when you're doing this, you know, they're, oh, what just happened? And then food, and then they start eating again. But we're just really trying to, yeah, it's going to induce some stress, but a lot less stress than if we let them kill one another, right? Use separate maintenance tools. Don't cross-contaminate with the easiest thing, the maintenance tools from your display to your quarantine. Maintenance tools for quarantine is really simple. You get a vinyl hose, a, a bucket, and then something to transfer your fishes with. So we're talking about $10 to $15 worth of, of, of additional equipment. It's really nothing extravagant. Um, and then disinfect it in between your, your quarantine um, rounds that you're doing. Acclimation, um, the first thing to know if you're getting your fishes shipped is, uh, Ammonia does start to build up in these shipping bags, and as soon as you open the bag, <laughs> ammonia can go through the roof, especially after long transit times. So neutralize ammonia. Uh, Prime works great, but know your retailer. There's potential contraindications with copper-treated water. So if you're getting copper-treated water and you're going to neutralize, um, you can straight up kill fish if, you're not, if you don't know what's in that water. Okay, so this is how we do acclimation. I did not invent this. This has been talked about for quite some time, but it can't be done. Um, this is one of my eight incoming systems. We have a lot of different systems. Each, each system is completely sterilized in between, and they're all different sizes, and I went really cheap on them. I was like, what's, what's cheap around the area? And this is one of them. Um, but you need a quarantine system to do acclimation this way. So what we actually do, as opposed to getting our shipping bag water to match the reef tank or quarantine tank water, we do it backwards. I get my incoming tank system to match my shipping water. Okay, and, and so the, the three parameters we need to worry about when acclimating fishes are salinity, temperature, and pH. I'm sure you guys all know how to do salinity and temperature. If not, get a book. Um, and pH is actually pretty straightforward too. Vinegar and muriatic acid we use to lower pH, aerate and calcoaster to raise. This is only for extreme methods. These work really well. Um, for example, in a 15-gallon quarantine, if you're getting a ship fish from someone online, uh, two, three drops of vinegar in a 15-gallon quarantine tank will probably bring it down to the appropriate level, which would be like 8.2 to, let's say, 7.9. Um, these things are amazing. You can get, like, inexpensive, affordable ones for $15 to $20. You're really not too worried about the accuracy of it. You, you want the, the, the precision of it. You want to be able to, to, to trend, see what the difference is in between this nasty bag water and your good incoming water is here. So we have our systems ready. Um, I'm calling my wholesalers and bugging them, what is this coming in at? What is this coming in at? And, uh, and 24 hours beforehand, I'm ready for them. Um, the fishes get there. I test two or three bags. Um, and then we act and immediately neutralize ammonia. And the rest of the fish, we can actually unload about two, 300 fish uh, within 10, 15 minutes. Slice the bag fish right out of the water and into the tank. Uh, no acclimation whatsoever. We get these fishes swimming, we get these fishes moving. Stress can start to decline. They're in filtered clean water with hiding places, not sitting in the bag freaking out. Um, but of course, you can't do this unless you have a quarantine system. So even if you're just doing passive quarantine, you're gonna reduce stress a lot by bringing your fishes and matching your incoming tank with your shipping bag water. Um, this is something I totally made up. Um, there's no bearing of it, but talking to industry professionals, public queries over the years, I wanted something that I could tell my clients, that I could tell my employees around the office, what is the best thing for all families of fishes um, to, to, to allow them to change within 24 hours. So for pH, we have plus or minus 0.2 pH points within 24 hours, plus or minus 0 0.002 units specific gravity within 24 hours, and plus or minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit within 24 hours. This is incredibly low stress on fish. Most fishes can take this without any issues. Um, but we even see some wholesalers saying, oh, no worries, you can bring your fish up from, you know, like 7.2 to 8.2 um, within an hour. Whew, that's putting a lot of unnecessary stress on these animals. So if I have them into my uh, incoming system, even if the pH and, and none of these levels are ideal because it's matched to the shipping bag water, now I can do it slowly. Now I can bring them up slowly and really get them going. Recovery time for blood and muscle metabolite and acid-base balance can be reduced to about two hours if the fish are allowed to swim. Get them out of the bags, get them into the tanks, let them swim, let these hormones start to dissipate. Full recovery of normal metabolism in fish takes up to 12 hours. Um, acclimating over these big changes takes a lot longer than most people think. Um, quick note on the drip acclimation is I say, Austin, I did a seven hour drip, app, drip acclimation with that fish, isn't that great? Oh my God, no. Um, keep it for, you know, coming from a retailer, keep it within like 20 minutes. 
Um, because otherwise, generally what we're seeing is people just completely overshoot that, and your pH and your temperature just starts to swing, and we're really stressing these fishes out more than necessary. Um, so so keep, it, keep it short if you're doing a drip acclimation. I don't like bag acclimation for the, the fishes seeing one another, and it just stresses them out. You can do a bag acclimation, basically the same thing. Just set it in a bucket and do a drip. It's easy. Transferring fishes, quick notes. Um, be careful using nets, especially the old school kind of broader rough mesh nets. It's easy for uh, gills to get caught in it and dorsals and so forth. Pond baskets are a great option. Um, you can disinfect them, they're really cheap. Um, fine white mesh nets are a good option and we do use these for bigger fishes. We use our hands a lot too, but a lot of people say, oh, fishes are slimy and they can poke you. And it's true, not so much the slimy part, but they can poke you. I've been jabbed many, many times. Um, so fine white nets are good. The gills do collapse during transfer. Um, move fast. There's a great study that I wanted to quote more of for this talk um, that actually said don't use anything that's pulling the fishes out of water. Transfer in a small body of water into our quarantine systems. But of course, then we're cross-contaminating immediately. So I do try to avoid that, um, but move fast. Within 30 seconds, they were seeing uh, an incredible, whoops, I'm going the wrong way here, guys, sorry. Within 30 seconds, they were seeing a lot higher uh, rates of, of issues with fish. So have your container here, pull the fish out, throw it in the tank, move on with your life. Low stress on the fish. Feeding, get calories into the fish. Um, for years, I, John Coppolino is a great, another mentor of mine, and I would say, John, what's the best food for this species of angelfish? Whatever they'll eat. Um, you know, we all want them to be on these amazing staples that we use. Um, but the bottom line is, when I'm getting fishes from wholesalers, maybe half of them on, any, on a good day will eat these prepared foods right out of the bag. And it's no one's fault, it's that they don't know what it is. We need to offer foods resembling natural prey. Um, so for, re, you know, for, for my end, getting these fishes pretty quick from the ocean, we need uh, black worms are a big thing, live brine are a big thing, fish eggs, because fish eggs, people go nuts for, uh, fishes go nuts for in the ocean when everyone starts breeding. Um, and then we need to emulate benthic feeding versus pelagic feeding, okay? Angel fishes and butterfly fishes are like, the loves of my life besides Lindsay, and um, they don't know what this stuff is floating around the water column unless we're talking about a plegic feeder like a genocanthus genus of angelfish. They pick at the reef, they pick at the gravel all the time, and we need to emulate that for fishes that don't understand. Um, they're interested based on the scent. We can see them looking around and smelling the food, but they're actually not gonna eat anything until we allow them to eat how they would in nature. So what we use a lot is empty clamshells. Uh, make our food into a paste, smear it in the clamshell, drop it on the bottom, all of a sudden, these fishes can go and pick at it at the bottom. Clams themselves are used pretty good. Um, and one of my good friends, Matt Wandell, has talked for years about using heads of broccoli and actually just smearing the food into the broccoli, setting it down on the bottom, and the fishes can go pick at it. You can use live rock chunks or coral skeleton too, but we need to make sure that they're going to be able to replicate how they eat in nature. And then over time, they still, oh, that is food, you know, and they start eating it right out of the water column. It just takes time for some of these guys. Feed small amounts frequently. We, we're feeding new imports a minimum of six times per day. Our target is 12 times per day. Um, so 10 to 12 times per day is what we're feeding most of our new imports. I do wean that down over about four weeks to uh, two times per day. I don't expect anybody to feed 12 times per day. It's an absolute nightmare. But we, even if they're not eating, we need to assure them that there's food present at all times um, so that they can really worry about de-stressing of other things like what is that angelfish through that egg crate gonna do when the lights go out? Um, you know, so keep the food going keep their metabolism going, um, and then eventually, you know, we can move them up to these easier to feed foods. Um, generally, some of the, the all-in-ones or the bigger staples um, won't be taken by some of these fishes that were really picky initially, so we have to emulate something that's really close to live brine. This is a great, for whatever reason, it's not a, not a great food, I'm not gonna say, like overall nutrition-wise, but a lot of fishes take it really fast because it looks just like live brine, and it's spirulina enriched. And then a little bit bigger mysis, and then bigger mysis, and then, you know, whatever a lot of people use, kind of something like these in their staples. Soak oily foods into chlorinated water and then strain them. Don't rinse them under the sink, and you're flushing a lot of nutrition down the sink when you do that. Uh, Nuri and Piskin is here, and, and they'll tell you the same thing. So, so don't rinse it, just, just soak it and strain it. And remove any uneaten food. Um, it, kind of as fast as possible. You know, within about 15, 20 minutes after feeding, I want everything off the bottom of the tank because otherwise we're just uh, following our water. So stay diligent, don't get lazy on that. Um, and here we're gonna take a, a quick uh, case study. Um, this first fish is that Pseudanthia charlinae I mentioned earlier. Um, it ate okay when it first came in, it got medicated a little bit, and for whatever reason, it stopped eating. And this is a glorious fish. Um, I actually want to talk to a couple people that are in here if they've ever seen one coming to the U.S. before, but it just stopped eating anything. So what I ended up doing is offering some live ghost shrimp because it's basically a grouper. Immediately it came out of hiding when it saw that movement. You can see how skinny it was there. Immediately uh, that spurred it. I got two or three into them, so it jump-started metabolism. And within a week after that, it was eating a lot of uh, easier prepared foods like mysis shrimp 
And you can see this guy's just eating everything under the sun. This was my first fish collected by submarine, Lipogramma clayi. I did not see this fish for a month. Um, it hid in this little thing. This was kind of the best view I could get of it. So I just kind of had to guess what was the best size food for eat it. Fish eggs worked really, really well, but I really didn't see him. That's what he did. And about a month later, he's eating from the pipette. He's coming out and he's eating right from it. So we kind of need to think like a fish. We need to let them de-stress and do their own thing in, in their time. Um, and, and eventually they will turn the corner. Medicating fish. Ugh. Medicating fish. Um, there's, there's a couple big buzzwords we hear these days. Cop, copper and praziquintal, uh, prazipro is, is how most people are dosing it. They're both phenomenal things. We use them a lot. I know anybody who's doing proper quarantine is using them a lot. But it's, it's the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, you're not going to treat a lot of things with copper and praziquintal. You are going to shake some of the most common ailments that we see. Um, but, but not everything. And unfortunately, I see a lot of retailers saying, oh, we treat with copper and prazi. Um, do you want this fish? And they just received it two days ago. Well, we're not going to kill anything with either of those in, in, in two days for the most part. Uh, so we're seeing people use it as, as, as a buzzword. But the goal for most hobbyists, in my opinion, should be to avoid medicating fishes. You know, be ready to do it, but, but avoid it. Um, some genre just can't tolerate it straight up, so you need to know what you're doing. They'll die with, with a copper treatment or whatever. Microscopic examination is required for most ailments, past some of the really common things that experienced aquarists are used to looking for. Um, this is one of my uh, cabinets housing uh, pharmaceuticals, and that's like over $2,000 worth of you know, zoological stuff to, to treat with a decent microscope. And, uh, and we see some really wicked stuff. Like the first time I saw something like this, I said, what the hell is that? It's a, a weapon from Game of Thrones, right? Like it's just, it looks so evil. Does anybody know what this is? This is a fish scale. So this is not anything evil. This is a fish scale. Um, this is how it anchors. But I still saw some, some issues here. So I would go back and forth on you know, various levels of magnification and try and figure out what the hell's going on. Because um, there was something going on with this fish. But, but yeah, you're going to see some really weird stuff under there, all kinds of bacteria, everything in the water column. And you need to know what to look for. I'm not great at it. I have some great books um, that I can reference. And then I have some great people in my life that uh, I formulate a, a good idea of what I think I'm facing. And I send out an email or a Facebook message or whatever. And, and then we kind of work together and figure it out. And this is how a lot of these things are done. There's no treatments for viral infections in ornamental fishes at this point. There, there's none. Um, it's, it's hold them for a long time, keep them in high quality water, and we can mm, supplement their food with, with uh, some vitamins and so forth, and that can help a lot, but there's no treatment. The only viral infections that are treated are in food fishes, and it's actually an injection, and it doesn't work in most medicated fishes, uh, ornamental fishes, so I have to be careful. Um, get a book. Don't rely on anecdotal accounts of hobbyists on forums. This book was recommended to me by Kevin Cohen years ago, and I really appreciate it. It was a great kind of like entrance into this world. I've actually been microscoping fishes since I was 17, but it, it's, it's still a steep learning curve forever, frankly. Um, this is probably one of the better ones out right now. It's by my friend Jay Hemdahl. It's, it's pretty recently released. It's like 30 or $40 online. Um, you know, we're not talking a crazy amount of money for this stuff. And then, when you've formed a good opinion and you have a good base knowledge, then hop on these forums and talk to these experienced aquarists who have done you know, a couple things here and there. But, but again, their sample size is tiny. This guy's was a million fish a year. He, he's curator of a public aquarium. He's seen hundreds of thousands of fishes per year. So the sample size is that people, well, I had like, you know, 10 fish that this worked. You should try it too. Um, some of it might be useful, but a lot of it isn't. And misidentification leading to the wrong treatment can be detrimental. I've seen people just outright kill a fish that probably would have been better without treating because they thought it was something else, threw a bunch of medications at it, they stopped eating, boom, fish, fish, fish died. So these are both great books and there's a lot of other ones. But a basic book, I'm not talking the $400 textbook type thing. These basic books are great. Pick one up. Okay, this is a quick uh, screenshot that I pulled from a table what I use around the office to figure out how much money I've put into fish, which I sell them for and so forth. I've removed a few things because I don't want people throwing a bunch of stuff at their fishes and killing them. But what I want you to see is here, we let fishes settle in and start eating, get calories into the fish, get calories in the fish, get calories in the fish. Once they start eating, I can wean them onto something else, we start prophylactic. But many issues arise at weeks two and three when I'm shaking, you know, ick velvet and even the most common flukes that we see. We still see a lot of stuff from external parasites falling off, bacterial infections starting to inhibit at two and three weeks. So remember back to those retailer slide, pushing fishes out within a week and so forth? If they're pushing fishes out within a week, who ends up with all these issues? All of you guys do. All of the end users do. Okay, and that's, in my opinion, this is why we see a lot of saltwater fish are so hard. I don't think they're that much harder. I think they have a very different supply chain than what people are seeing. Anyways, proper treatment takes time and can cost a lot. This was over six weeks. This took a long time to do this batch. And it cost me over $8 per fish. So if I, and that's just medication and water changes, not time, not labor for six weeks of work. So, you know, green chromos and, and blue damsels, I lost 
my tail on in this fish because nobody's going to pay $30 for a green chromosome. and I don't blame you. Um, so we just don't sell that many of them. That's fine. Social acclimation. This is, this is huge. I wanted the entire talk to be on social acclimation, actually. Fishes are jerks, um, right? Like, that's, they're, they're just jerks. And existing fishes have established hierarchy and territories. Absolutely utilize if you opt out of quarantine. Absolutely do this. Um, I won't even consider talking about warranty if, if someone's not socially acclimating because now you're telling, you're saying, Austin, I want, uh, you know, I have to rely on your existing fish to not beat up or kill your new fish. Um, I don't know what you have, uh, you know, that's not to mention your feeding or, or your acclimation process or anything. That's just saying your new fish uh, is, is going to survive the beatings of my existing fish. No way. So throw them in a, gr a good acclimation box. Keep a hiding place in there for them. I um, mean, we can see here, this is Bradley Siphus, a uh, great little rass tank he's got and some angels and stuff, and they're, they're looking at one another. But if this fish wanted to beat the crap out of this new fish, um, it would try to do so through the side of the, the box. And we could make an educated decision then, is this even going to work? Or most of the time what we see is any uh, aggression through an acclimation box subdues after a few days. Um, so give them a chance. Give them a chance to settle into your water. Give them a chance to eat. Give them a chance to de-stress after that little move. And, uh, and don't let your new fishes kill it. It doesn't have to be fancy. That was a fancy acclimation box. Here's one of Matt Peterson's really, really awesome maroon clownfish in an egg crate zip tied box. You know, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, I needed an emergency thing for uh, this sunburst because I was out of my other boxes and I ate a bunch of ice cream. Um, and then grabbed my uh, soldering iron, learned this from Kevin Cullen. It's, it's a great way to, uh, to poke holes in a little plastic thing um, and get some flow through there. And this is kind of our go-to now. We bought this industrial netting and stuff. And, and I really like having a lot of holes. Ensure a lot of flow is going through there. Of course, the fishes can't get out. But let some food just flow through these boxes and flow back out. It's going to wash away nutrients. And we want, need to make sure that they're getting enough oxygen to these fishes too. I've seen uh, people kill fish because they're actually just like not around flow. Mr. Koji will have 20 of these in, in his quarantine system sometimes, and he just puts a little power head next to him, blow water through it, no big deal. Um, you can also do the, the, the all out big separations. Some of you guys might recognize these two. These are my babes. I've got uh, a girlfriend, a dog, and, and two banded angels. Those are my pets. Um, and these were phenomenal fish. They're the cutest little things when they came in, but they came in the exact same size, which anyone that knows about pairing angel fishes, that's kind of the opposite of what you want. A little bit bigger and a little bit smaller is much easier. So I said, ah, whatever, we're going to just separate the whole tank. Um, and I ended up leaving them like this for about two months, which is obviously pretty long. Um, but what I saw towards the month and a half mark, one of these fishes started growing uh, considerably faster. I'd seen this before too. This is just my personal example. And about 30% bigger than the other fish. Within a month and a half, these fishes were. He changed sex. They established hierarchy without changing, uh, without ever touching one another, and that's anecdotally me saying he changed sex. I didn't really look for it, but that's how angel fishes work, and there's a pretty good thought process behind that. So when I pulled this, there was almost no physical interaction, and it was amazing. There, there's a little bit, but not too much. So leave separated for a minimum of two days, up to as long as it takes. The longer you do it, probably the better off your fishes are going to be. It's important to know that these decisions we're making aren't just to affect the, uh, our, our personal Aquariums. We are being watched, and, and there's a lot of places out there, unfortunately, um, using propaganda. Um, they're, you know, these, these bad choices some people can make can fuel fire, but they're not using data. They're using complete propaganda, even making up some facts, which we'd all like to say. We have some data now. Data's getting better. We'd all like to say, oh, this is BS, total BS. No one would believe this. But we've seen propaganda can work, um, you know, and, and, and that's kind of unfortunate that it can work. And whatever you feel about this film, this was not a documentary. And why does it work? It works because people are inspired. Okay, people are inspired by what they see in person, by what they can touch. If you have a little plush you grow up with and you're going to sleep with it every night, it's going to inspire you. You feel it. You feel the animal. And what we have is really a, you know, emotion and logic separation here. And with the, the vast majority of public, it's way easier to sway based on emotion. Um, so that tells us we need to just use education and inspiration to inspire conservation for these animals. This is my youngest brother and two of his friends. And you know, they're just amazed every time they see this stuff. And I can sit there and be like, corals are like flowers. They do this, they do this. And it inspires people. And like Dr. Rich Powell was talking about yesterday, we can really get a lot of other people that are focusing on conservation and, and what we can do to better off the industry as a whole. So as hobbyists, we can support sustainably collected livestock, actually support aquaculture. We need to be prepared for these animals. We need to be proactive for these animals, not wait for them to be swimming on their side before we do anything. We need to socially acclimate. And the bottom line is respect the fish. Respect the fish. 
Uh, my inspiration comes far and wide. Several of these guys are sitting in my room, and I like want to cry that they're here. This is just amazing. Um, but the, the, you know, the only guy that ever really inspired me is sitting right here, and and he's he's here now. Aquarius of the Year, congratulations again, Joe. That's an amazing accomplishment. But I have driven inspiration from so many people over the years, and a lot of these guys are in this room. So thank you so much to all of them. Thank you to my best friends, whom I would not be here without: Todd Cherry and Brett Harris, and the love of my life, Lindsay. Thank you, Magna. Thank you.